To be martyred is to be annihilated and reconstituted as a ghost. A person ends, and because their misery is common, their memory is possessed by history. An image plastered upon signs and raised up as a banner by millions of human hands. This is the fate that befell George Floyd on the 25th of May, 2020, as he was crushed on Minneapolis tarmac. He, father, husband, and friend, was ended, joining a seemingly infinite list of black and oppressed people murdered by the US's police forces. In the following days and weeks, as protests surged, first across the United States and then the world, his memory was possessed. The movement that has blossomed as a consequence of his murder is the subject of this video. To the man and those who loved him, we offer first our sorrow, our rage and our ears. May he rest in power. Uh, I don't have a, a lot to say because I can't get my words together right now. But I wanted everybody to know that this is what those officers took <laughs> at the end of the day they get to go home and be with their families Shiana does not have a father he will never see her grow up graduate he will never walk down the aisle. <clears throat> if it's a problem she's having and she needs her dad, she does not have that anymore. <clears throat> I'm here for my baby. And I'm here for George because I want justice for him. I want justice for him because he was good. No matter what anybody thinks, he was good. And this is the proof that he was a good man. If the masses of our people suffer for our advancement, progress only comes when the masses advance. If the masses do not progress, there's no progress at all. If one knows this, there's no discussion about since the 60s. Certainly since the 60s, many individuals have climbed up. Some have become mayors, some basketball players, some football players, some on television, some movie directors. All of this is a result of the struggles of the masses of the people. But the conditions of the masses of our people become worse. For someone to discuss progress means that they're clearly confused. There's been no progress for our people. The conditions are worse. The only progress for our people is a rising consciousness of the masses which will never stop. 
aside from the rising costs of our people, the conditions are worse for the masses of our people. If you have rising consciousness and worse conditions, if you have rising consciousness and worse conditions, there's no question you're heading for the path of revolution. It is impossible to account for the depth of the US state's racist depravity, let alone summarize it. At each point that one feels they have reached the bottom of the barrel, another barrel is uncovered. This can be swiftly illustrated. Between 2014 and 2019, police in the United States are acknowledged to have killed 6,557 people, 25% of them black. Black people constitute 38% of the US prison population. This is despite the fact that black people account for only 13% of the US population. As astonishingly despicable as these statistics are, they are but the tip of the iceberg. A report on the New York Police Department's use of force, produced and suppressed in 2017, illustrates this clearly, estimating that police murders were at least double that reported officially. Whilst the majority of the world peers into this violence only when it flares into a people's confrontation, it is constant, ferocious, and deeply rooted in the history and character of the US state. This nation, built upon genocide and chattel slavery, has never changed, despite the heroism and sacrifice of those who have stood to resist it. The continuity is stark. The lynch mobs which hunted escaped slaves in the southern states have formed into their police departments and settled across the whole country. The peoples placed in chains by chattel slavery today make up the largest population demographic of its prisons, where such slavery is not only legal, but practiced. This is to say, in statistics and historical reference, what many have said simply and directly. The US's state and society are the state and society of white supremacy. It is, so to speak, in the nation's blood. This oppression, which impacts upon every element of life, has intensified considerably since the outbreak of the coronavirus. A crucial observation if one is to grasp our present conjecture. This is clear from the scale of COVID-19 deaths within the black population, 25% of the US's total toll, one of the largest in the globe. Where the shadow of death has not been felt directly, the violence of poverty stands in for it. Of the millions made unemployed in the US by the global collapse of imperialist capitalism, unemployment for the black population has grown fastest, from 5.8% in February to at least 16.8% in May, higher than it was for this section at the height of the Great Depression. In comparison to a May statistic of 12.4% for the US's white population. For the black proletariat in the United States in particular, this intensification has made life intolerable. The eruption which followed George Floyd's murder is thus the result of two contexts intertwining. A permanent violence ingrained into the character of the US and already intensifying under the reaction which defines its contemporary politics has been brought to a boil by the first pangs of its collapse. The significance of the renewal of the Black Lives Matter movement was evident from its dawning moments. 
as police set upon the largely black and working class protesters assembled to demand justice in Minneapolis on the 26th of May, an avalanche was set in motion. A police station was burnt down on but the third night. The violence of those who answered to it was recorded and spilt through phones across the globe. Within a week, demonstrations were underway in every state in the US. Despite horrific police oppression, attacks from the far right, the activation of the National Guard in Washington DC following confrontations outside of the White House, and curfews in over 200 cities. Whilst the ferociousness of this early explosion has waned in some senses, with liberal and opportunist forces attempting to co-opt demands for police abolition into demands for police reform, and both police and National Guard employing counterinsurgency tactics applied in Iraq and Afghanistan to de-escalate tension at key moments. It is clear that what remains is a considerably serious political movement. Protests have continued for over a month at time of writing, and Black Lives Matter has emerged as a movement across a huge number of nations in both the imperialist and oppressed world, each reacting not only to the situation in the States, but also to the violence and racism of their own ruling class or those imposed upon them. More than this, it is clear that the movement in the US is in the process of developing a serious organizational base, with political projects mounted in many communities. A Capitol Hill autonomous zone holding space in Seattle from the 8th of June, albeit with considerable compromise, and solidarity from striking dock workers, shutting down 29 ports on the US's west coast on the 19th of June. The capacity of the forces which have revealed themselves to stop oppression is, however, perhaps most clearly illustrated by the breakup of a police kidnapping and sexual assault ring by Milwaukee community members on the 24th of June. The oppressed have again burst into US history as a real force. They came for us with AR-15 robots, military gear for mothers and babies. So I think at this time, it is important that we stick together and we organize after this, after this righteous anger, we get in our communities and we organize. Because we the people, this system is crumbling. It is crumbling. We see it all over the world. We are going to decide what happens next. What the fuck? Did you hear him? He said, out of the way. He said, yeah, move, move, move. Come on. Come on. Light him up. Go inside now. Get in the hole. Today I have strongly recommended to every governor to deploy the National Guard in sufficient numbers that we dominate the streets. Mayors and governors must establish an overwhelming law enforcement presence until the violence has been quelled. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. The response of the U.S. bourgeoisie to this explosion of popular resistance is complex and diverse. Trump has used this development to attempt to institute himself as a fascist dictator, as expressed by his labeling of anti-fascism as terrorism on the 31st of May, a form of political repression already being actively followed up by the FBI. Repeated attempts to deploy the US military by use of the 1807 Insurrection Act and encouragement of police forces in their use 
of barbarous repression. However, in doing so, he has brought a number of contradictions within his project to the fore, fracturing his support in both the ruling class and the assorted militias that make up the political vanguard of his reactionary petty bourgeois social base. This fracturing is perhaps most clear in respect to the US ruling class, with the neoconservative wing of the Republican Party in the process of breaking away from him, a point emphasised by John Bolton's recently published White House memoir. The growth of Republican voters against Trump, the Lincoln Project and other anti-Trump voting blocs and considerable dissent from the Supreme Court. The White House's relationship to the military is also under considerable strain, with both the former Secretary of Defence, James Mattis, and his successor, Mark Esper, arguing that Trump's invocation of the 1807 Insurrection Act is unconstitutional. This has resulted in an increasing reliance of the Trump administration upon its far-right supporters in the population, private militias and the US's police forces in an attempt to secure a stable social base. The violence that this has produced is monstrous. Police murders and brutality picking up pace considerably. Hordes of paramilitary fascist forces either deputised or given clandestine favour by the state, even to the point of allowing open lynchings and tear gas and pepper spray being used as instruments of murder in the US's concentration camps for immigrants. However, this terror does not yet appear to indicate that a stable basis for fascism in the sense it was imposed in the 20th century has been formed. This is easily seen with regard to Trump's clandestine support among far-right militias, who frequently disagree upon the nature of their projects. For every more traditional, modernist, fascist faction, there are a greater number of unstable, postmodern factions who hold a considerably different vision. The most clarifying example of this second type can be found in the so-called Boogaloo movement, a prepper community, some of which hold an all-consuming process of social collapse and violence as their objective. More Mad Max than Nazi Germany. Whilst it is clear that something resembling a more traditional fascist society is now imposing itself on the US via institutional forces, point made clear by the Department for Homeland Security's use of unmarked military forces as Gestapo in Portland in mid-July, a force now to be rolled out across the country. This latter vision of social collapse is more realistic in the long term for two simple reasons. Ideologically, the Trump project offers no vision whatsoever, save for his own image. It is a brand that does not contain any serious political project. A point emphasized by Trump's decision to give his most vocal support to the conspiracist QAnon cult, who believe he has been sent by God to save America in alliance with the military, and now has a number of Trump-approved congressional candidates. Economically, capitalism is incapable of maintaining the class force which fascism relies upon, the petty bourgeoisie, as the crash it has embarked upon since the outbreak of COVID-19 can only deepen. As such, a key distinction between the fascisms of the 20th and 21st century emerges. In the 20th century, the forces of fascism represented a process of capitalist restoration. Today, they represent the vanguard of extinction. Uptown, funk you up. Uptown, funk you up. Come on, man. 
Yeah. Okay, I like this. Let's keep it going. The contradictions plaguing the Trump project have provided considerable room for another section of the US bourgeoisie, largely organized by the Democrats or within the ranks of the liberal media, to move. This is expressed in a number of developments. For example, a vote in Congress to render Washington DC as the 51st state of America in an attempt to allow political struggle in the capital on the 26th of June. Whilst this and other attempts represent serious political challenges, they are clearly not enough. This is made clear by the reliance of this wing of the bourgeoisie upon gathering the support of Black Lives Matter protesters by making gestures toward police reform. Whilst the demands of the movement were initially that of police abolition, this process has posed considerable ideological problems for its development. While some of the reforms are easy to demonstrate as absurd and useless, for example, a tear gas ban broken on the second day of its implementation in Seattle, a ban on chokeholds denounced by police unions, or attempts to pass off a slight reduction in planned increases of police funding as defunding the police. Others are more slippery, such as a promise from Minneapolis City Council to disband its police department on the 8th of June, which is now tied up in discussions around whether or not such action is in line with the city's constitution. Although a broader discussion on abolition is beyond the scope of this short film, it is clear that the offer of reforms is being used to attempt to placate protesters in an effort to secure a political bloc in support of the liberal bourgeoisie as against Trump. The reforms themselves must not be rejected outright, as they can provide room for the movement to breathe in certain instances but they must be exposed as insufficient to meet the demands of the masses or to advance them. It is already clear that this section of the bourgeoisie has considerably different interpretations of the meaning of police abolition than demonstrators. Its last administration continued the trend of hiring private mercenary forces to bulk out the US Army, something it is not hard to see occurring in relation to police forces under the command of this bourgeois faction. Equally, it is clear that the police will not accept these terms, as is brutally illustrated by the doxing of a pro-reform Oklahoma City councillor leading to a break-in at her house and the rape of her neighbour on the 3rd of July. Once the looting starts, the shooting starts. Yeah, you have a president talking about the Second Amendment as a use for people to come out here and use firearms you against the people that are protesting. Yeah. This is the messages that we're seeing. I don't know if you on social media because the news don't tell you everything. But you have to pay attention to what's going on. Or else we're gonna we have a, a president that's trying to incite a race war. And when the borders are closed, we can't leave. You have people in here that need your help. This is when you and y'all, y'all stand together with the community, with society to stop the to, to stop the governmental oppression, period. We need you. So, so then march with us, march beside us, you, you get your people. Y'all march beside us, march beside us. March beside us, let the revolution be televised. March beside us and show us that you're here for us. Make history, Make history with us, please. Let's just do it, march with us. We'll start marching and you march with us, please. Just do it, do it, just come on. Be the change, do it, do it, please, do it, please. We are good people. I give you because I can't leave this post. I will march through this street with you guys to that next intersection. I don't know. I will march from this intersection to that intersection, but I have to control this area. Control. What is it to control, man? March with us. It was send. It was send a huge message. We just march. Just march with us. March the whole round with us. March you and your men. Y'all protect us. Protect us, y'all march with us. March yeah. around like we just did. Do that march with us, y'all stand beside us. You no, know, you don't because you the protector. So if you 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 can't patrol yourself, if it's you that's supposed to be patrolling us, then walk with us. I'm also protecting some of these businesses. Okay, okay. Can you do me a favor? Can you do me a favor? Can you take a kneel? 
Can you take a deal? I don't know. They ain't enough for me. They ain't enough for me. They ain't enough for me. Let me see you take a deal. Whilst it is too early to hold any certain expectation on how the struggle in the US will develop, what is very clear is that the convictions of primarily black Marxists have been proven entirely correct. The black proletariat in the US has emerged beyond any shadow of a doubt as a political vanguard of the workers and oppressed. Although there are a number of struggles ahead for the movement, their leadership has created, primarily with regard to the nature of the US as an imperialist nation and the question of organisation, what has already been achieved is beyond anything that has emerged in the imperialist nations, save for France, since the 1960s. Both the liberal and the fascist bourgeoisie are fractured and seem to be incapable of stemming the tide. Concession upon concession has been granted in an attempt to break off the movement's support among other sections of the proletariat and oppressed. With decisions to ban workplace discrimination against LGBT people on the 15th of June, to shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline on the 8th of July, and to observe the treaty rights of the indigenous population in Oklahoma on the 9th of July, exempting them from the US's laws in half of the state. This cannot work if it is explained clearly that these decisions are wholly the result of the actions of the masses, that the fight for black liberation taken up by the masses has paved the way for a retreat of reaction, and that this struggle must continue if the nightmares of US fascism and social collapse are to be averted. For what has been demonstrated by the courage and heroism of those standing up in the US and across the world is simple. The masses have immeasurable strength. A proletarian avalanche is beginning. Socialism is an integral part of building social justice on this planet. The condition of my people, my history, was very much connected with other oppressed people. And I began to see that the same foot that was on the necks of the Vietnam, Vietnamese people, that was on the necks of all oppressed people on the planet, was the same foot that was on my neck. And so I began to understand that imperialism has to go. It is a poison that is killing people all over this world. The priorities of this planet have to be completely changed. And instead of profits, instead of uh, policies that destroy the earth, that destroy the water, that destroy human beings, I believe a policy that protects people, that makes people live in a, a community, a world community, that's what I believe. That's my basic political commitment.